Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this is the second in our winter learning series. My name is Dana Ripper. I'm with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Uh, our mission as an organization is the conservation of birds and really all wildlife and their habitats via science, education, and advocacy. And we are presenting this winter learning series of 11 total webinars. Again, this is the second in partnership with the Missouri Birding Society. And we have an awesome lineup of speakers throughout the entire series. Uh, so I hope you join us for all of the ones that you can over the next 10 weeks or so. Um, this evening, I am super happy to introduce Mark McKellar. Uh, Mark is a wildlife biologist who has studied birds for more than 35 years. He has a degree in wildlife and fisheries from North Carolina State University. He has worked for North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, the North Carolina Museum of Life and Science, the Missouri Department of Conservation, the Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania, and the Nature Conservancy in Missouri, amongst others. Um, he worked at and with many nature centers and his heart was in education. So he and his wife, Melanie, purchased the Backyard Bird Center in 2002, where they adopted the theory to run their retail business like a nature center. Mark really meant it when he adopted the slogan, come by and let's talk birds. So I'm going to hand it over to Mark right now to tell us about winter sparrows. Thank you, Dana. Oh, uh, we, we moved here 30 years ago and I was working for the Missouri Department of Conservation. And I, uh, I, I, one of the things you have to do when you work for NDC in the education division where I was is you had to submit ideas for the Missouri Conservationist magazine. And one of the, the topics that I chose, I, I jotted down three or four, and one of them that I uh, chose was to write about winter sparrows of Missouri. And the other one was the tale of two foxes. And uh, lo and behold, both of those got chosen as uh, articles for uh, the magazine, and they uh, printed it as a brochure for many years. And until just a few years ago, you could still get this brochure online now. It is no longer online. I couldn't find it anywhere. But if you have a print copy of that, uh, it, it, it's an antique now. Uh, and I don't kid myself. Uh, you know, I, it was my idea and I, and you know my writing, but it was Jim Rathert's photos. And if you know Jim Rathert, you know what a great photographer he is. He was working for the Conservation Department magazine back then. And uh, so I almost all the pictures in it our gems and they and, and it was really pretty to look at but uh, that's you know the reason I chose sparrows um, is because uh, to write about is because I have always considered sparrows the Rodney Dangerfields of the bird world and they they don't get any respect you know they you know, that's what you know, Rodney, Rodney used to say you know I can't get any respect well why don't they get it whenever you ask somebody what they have you're coming to your bird feeder you know you get oh I have cardinals and blue jays and in those little brown birds you know that's the, and and so why don't sparrows get the respect that they deserve and and, and part of it um is it, it, they're a confusing group of birds. And one of the reasons why they're a confusing group of birds is because they are so many lookalikes um, out there. I mean, you know, uh, here on the upper left is a female house finch, uh, the mark below her is a female purple finch, and then a hermit thrush in the upper right and a pine siskin. So whenever, whenever you're brown and striped, uh, there that, that fits a lot of birds in the, the natural world. But the worst of all, the worst case uh, it, it, for their their lack of respect, it comes from the imposters and the, the introduced species that occur in huge numbers and they, uh, you know, they overtake feeders and, and, and when people try to feed birds or, you know, they, they have a lot of these, especially in urban settings. Um, and the, the number one culprit, of course, is the male house sparrow here on the left. The male and female house sparrows were introduced into this country to be the savior of the American farmer. Um, they didn't study that very well back then. And they found out that, uh, of course, once they had made the mistake of introducing the house sparrows into this country, that they really don't 
eat insects very much. They eat them for a short period during the nesting season, but the rest of the time they eat grain, which is the very thing that they thought they were bringing them in here to protect, or, or the farmers. And so the, the house sparrows spread uh, rapidly all across the country, and um, within a few years of uh, introducing them, they realize their mistake and they actually put bounties on these birds and, you know, for people to try to kill them. But of course, it was too late because they had just exploded in growth and they oh, everywhere. They actually published uh, house sparrow recipes in cookbooks back in those early years in the 40s and 50s, trying to get people uh, to, to uh, control them that way. But there was no controlling the house sparrows uh, once they exploded. And since we are in Missouri... Um, definitely have to mention the other one, uh, its cousin, uh, the uh, Eurasian tree sparrow, uh, which you know, they are starting to move across. But, you know, they, they were for so many years, really, uh, especially bird for the St. Louis area. Uh, but uh, we've actually had, uh, I don't know, two or three uh, birds that are here this winter in Kansas City. So they are moving a little bit, but nothing to the likes of what the house sparrows did. Um, but they're not true sparrows. You know, they don't belong in our, our sparrow group at all. Um, but just their sheer numbers and, uh, you know, in urban, uh, their nesting problems, their com competition with bluebirds. And they, these birds have helped uh, given sparrows a bad name. So our native sparrows, uh, you know, what are they? Well, they're generally small brown streaked birds, varying degrees uh, in, in the family of uh, Passerella, it's I can't even say it. Uh, Passerella V, and they, uh, it used to be Embericity, and I had to change that. That's how the, the, whenever I was editing this program, since the last time I'd given it. Um, then, and usually they're feeding on the ground. Uh, they scratch like a chicken with double feet scratches and things like that. Again, they only eat insects really in the brief nesting season with their babies. Uh, and they are related to toeys and some of the buntings and, and long spurs. So uh, they're a group. But where where to look for sparrows? Um, you know, sparrows are very, very widespread and habitat dependent, but the common denominator is really brush. They love brushy areas uh, and open fields. I, you know, if you, if it, especially out here in Western Missouri, um, if you see in a farm field, if you see a brush pile at the edge of a farm field or, or, or in the edge of a pasture, that's, that brush pile is going to have sparrows in it, you know, and usually Harris sparrows and white crown sparrows for us, but also uh, a lot of the others. And, and then, of course, some are more woodland oriented near creeks and streams, but they, and, and of course, bird feeders. That's the, one of the things that the message is having my, my the bird store that I do have uh, and uh talk to a lot of uh, bird feeder people as I'm all constantly encouraging to, to to look at those little brown birds, if you will, at, at, underneath their feeders, because there's lots of beautiful native sparrows that occur uh, at bird feeders, especially during the harsh periods. Uh, they go in the snow and the, the, everything's covered up with snow and ice. That's when they tend to be pushed in uh, to bird feeders. So, you know, it, it, for people who want to see as many different kinds of birds in their backyard as they can, which is a goal of many bird feeder people, um, the sparrow, I always tell people the sparrows are a way to add several new species to your, your yard list if you just learn to identify them. So they, where do you start uh, when you want to identify a sparrow? By the way, the last sparrow was a, uh, a really gray uh, fox sparrow. Um, and we'll talk about the individual sparrows here more. But the keys of identifying sparrows, because they are overwhelming to a lot of people, and that is, you know, they're all basically brown and basically striped. Uh, so how do you separate them out? You know, it's like, you know, at, you know gulls and, and shorebirds, you know, intimidate people mildly. Well, how, well sparrows uh, intimidate people a lot, too. And it's basically the backyard feeder people don't have to worry about the gulls and the shorebirds. So the, the sparrows are identified as that confusing group. Well, where I like to start is uh, I, I, I the first I divide sparrows into two basic groups. So what we're going to talk about here, and that is, uh, do they have striped breast or plain breast? And then once I separate the two out there, it's how we're going to do this program. And then you can look at the more detailed, uh, uh, interesting field markings on the head, the you know the 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 cap, the uh, the mallard striping. Uh, you know, their tail is it short or is it long? 
kind of where you're seeing it and how it's acting, all of those play a role into separating things down. And one of the things that are, is always so good to do, and when I talk about identifying birds, I always talk about you know, the willingness to take notes, you know, make uh, field notes, sketches. Uh, when you see a new bird and you, you look at it on the ground, I always tell that my very first lab and ornithology class in college, our, our uh, assignment was to uh, pick out a bird, watch it, uh, describe it, and then bring it into the next lab and then uh, and, and read what, you know, everybody wrote about the bird they observed. And then it was also the last assignment we did in ornithology lab. And it was amazing how the difference, <laughs> how much we had learned in the semester, you know, the, the, the first ones were and the, it was brown. It has stripes, and it was little. I mean, that's what we, you know, the kind of notes that we had. And then at the end, you know, the last class was much more detailed. So the more detailed and and, and just a you know sketches will really help you whenever you go to identify the birds. And you know, like I said, when you concentrate on things like the head and the breast and the tail, uh, and you make those notes, so that whenever you go go to look it up in a book. Um, you know, books can, uh, field guides can influence you what you're, as to what you're describing. So if you wrote it down, instead of that, that field guide, you know, you're looking at it going, oh yeah, I think I saw that. Well, if you wrote it down, you know that you did or you didn't see that, that stripe breast or that uh, eye stripe or the crown stripe, things like that in there and the color of the bill, the color of the legs, things like that. So, you know, I always take field notes and, and, and sparrows are a great example of how that will help you. Um, whenever you go to, to try to identify a bird that you really don't know. All right, where we start, the streak breast group versus the clear breast group. And then this is the Lincoln Sparrow on the left and a uh, field sparrow on the right and the prime examples of a clear breast versus a striped breast. So the two basic groups of uh, the sparrows and then the streak breast group, we're going to start with them and, and kind of kind of going from the most common to the least common that occurs here in winter. Now, remember, this program is about winter sparrows. And so I know there are more sparrows than what I'm going to talk about here, but I'm only covering the, the sparrows that, uh, that, that typically occur here in winter. And the first being the song sparrow. The song sparrow is uh, one of the most common sparrows there are, um, especially in northern Missouri. Uh, it, it, it's, it, but I think in the winter, they're pretty widespread. And what are some of the things that we key in on when we're looking at uh, the, the, the song sparrows? We're going to go over that in detail. And then there's the fox sparrows, one of the largest sparrows, probably the largest sparrow we have, that in the white crown um, in, in the streak breast group. Uh, and the Lincoln sparrow that was in the last picture. Savannah sparrows and the and, and Lacan sparrows. So the, the the latter two, I don't ever see at bird feeders. Uh, there's a bird. They're they're much more field birds, and they're a lot, uh, especially the Lacans is much uh, less common than than the other group ones in this group. But this is what I consider the streak breast group. So we'll start with the song sparrow. And one of the things that really strikes you out, if you when you're looking, you first see that bird right there. You know what are some of the things that jump out at you? What, what is, what was something you would uh, take note of here uh, in, in from this picture? And I think from this angle, you know, the, it, you can't see its chest in this well, but you can see that malar stripe, which is extending from the base of the bill down, the Fu Manchu mustache, if you will, uh, something that would jump out at you there. And the other thing that a lot of people don't look at, which is an important thing to, to separate it out from, say, a savanna sparrow, is that long tail. with The, the long rounded tail would be something you would make, it would help you make a note of. Now, <laughs> One thing that you, you could do an hour long program, maybe on all the subspecies of song sparrows, because there are a, a tremendous number of variation of song sparrows. And I remember back in the early days of ornithology, when I, when I was uh, studying in college and um, first in the field, the foremost expert on song sparrows in the country was a retired school teacher from Pennsylvania. Uh, she studied these birds uh, and knew every vocalization, every chip note, everything that they did. And, and, uh, and it, so it, it was just her passion in life. So there are lots of things to, uh, uh, to key in on, but they are very striped chested. And they typically have a dark central dot in the center of their chest. It gathers. Unfortunately, I didn't have a, a really great picture that showed that. Um, but the it is one of the 
the variations, the, the spots that they are identifying marks that are so important in identifying song sparrows. So the, uh, the, the fox sparrow, which is much larger uh, in size than the song sparrow, but this angle shows this dark central spot there in the central chest, which is good. But the other things that really separate us, when you look at these two birds, they're very striped, they're very brown and gray uh, in color, and they can look uh, superficially similar. But things that will jump out, if you look closely and you make notes, notice the bill color. Notice how this fox sparrow's lower mandible is yellow and part of the upper mandible, where that song sparrow was a dark, dark bill, all of it. It also has a kind of a Fu Manchu mustache. It's the Malar stripe striking down there. But if you look at the stripes on the chest, you will notice that the stripes are little arrowheads that uh, uh, and toward the center of the chest, you can see they're very broken and you can see their individual arrowheads, but the, the ones on the up on the upper flank are kind of joined together so that you can't see this, the, the individual, they look like solid stripes, but these are little individual arrowheads. And these birds are famous for their, their kicking uh, uh, two, two feet underneath the brush. And uh, it's often an indication you've got one uh, when you're bird watching is you see leaves moving in the underbrush and, uh, and at the edge of the brush. I mean, the, these guys will feed at bird feeders, especially if you spread millet uh, or a ground throw down near the edges of the bushes. They feel much safer down there on the edges of the bushes. So um, they're, they're a very popular sparrow. They vary a lot in color. The ones out west are much grayer than this and much darker uh, and a lot of variation in them. Um, the ones here tend to be more reddish, especially in the wings and the tail. You can see that. But uh, they're a very, very popular bird. They're big scratchers, as I say. So now, on the other end of that, the much smaller uh, uh, striped sparrow, which is the Lincoln sparrows. And Lincoln sparrows, to me, uh, immediately says, uh, when I think of a Lincoln sparrow, I think of fine, fine stripes, see how much thinner the streaking is on the chest, a uh, very gray in the face and the back of the head. Those are the things that jump out at me. Um, but also, they have a buffy band across their chest with that fine strike streaking across there. And sometimes there'll be a central dot. Uh, it, it's not always there, but the very fine stripes um, is a very good indication that you have a Lincoln Sparrow. Uh, they, uh, in some winters, uh, they get pushed far to the south of us. Sometimes we have them here in the Kansas City region in northern Missouri. We have them here all winter, and, and in certain years, uh, they, they, they settle further south. I think it depends on the, on the conditions, of course. So um, they, uh, at, at, I know if you if you travel to Colorado and things where they nest, uh, they sing a lot, and they'll be sing they'll sing in the spring sometime when they're here, and I think they sound like a house house or in uh, a, a bit singing. So they're they're a really interesting bird. They have a pretty song, um, but they are they are small. They're the smaller, but they have that rusty red cap like so many of them do. So. All right, and then the, the the secret of one of the much of the most, of course, the Lacan sparrow. Um, it, they these, like I said, I've never seen one at uh, my bird feeders before. Uh, very orange in the face, the, the striping in the face. Uh, they uh, like thick grass, wet grass, uh, and and they a lot of times when we're looking for them, we look for them in grass around or below a pond dam and things like that. There's uh, they, they do like those wet, wet grasses. Um, they, they do have the fine streaking along the, the flanks and things, uh, but the gray and the, the, the orange in uh, this uh, bird to me just makes it jump out over all the others. And again, if you're talking about bird feeders and backyards, this is one that, that that's probably not going to uh, be there. And it, it, and the winters in numbers more toward the, in Southern Missouri in the winter than, than in the Northern part of the state. So and then the savanna sparrow. Uh, uh, this is a, a beautiful bird that is uh, a grassland species uh, and very common here in this part of the state and in, in, in the western northwestern part in migration in spring and in fall. 
Uh, but in winter, I'm saying they they may winter, and you people that live in southern Missouri, you know, they that you may have them down there all winter. But up in this part of the world, um, again, a lighter sparrow uh, is a bird that can be confused superficially with a song sparrow, but uh, it has a shorter, uh, stubbier tail, like a lot of grassland birds do. The grassland birds tend not to have long tails; they tend to have short tails, and and uh, and it does have a. Uh, maybe not as dark and pronounced as the malar stripe as the uh, the, the song sparrows do, but that has this yellowish eye line uh, right above the the eye there. Uh, it, it especially in the spring, whenever uh, they're getting into breeding plumage, that yellow is more pronounced up there. Uh, and usually you see them, in, we see them in large numbers along gravel roads and uh, especially farm roads near pastures and things that you see a lot of savanna sparrows and, and migration and, and big flocks. Um, they they may have, again, like most of these striped birds, they may have that little central spot, but their streaking is much finer, not as fine as a Lincoln's, but uh, much uh, finer than uh, a song sparrow. So uh, the pink legs, uh, you know, it, it, you, sometimes you just have to add all those factors up. Um, I like that central um, uh, I, crown stripe is good. This angle is really good for that. To see that that on there. So uh, the the savanna sparrows are again a, a bird much more common in migration for us through most of the state, uh, but more to the south. So okay, I, again. When I'm doing this program live, you know, obviously I'm answering questions between the groups and things, but I think, you know, with this many people, we're going to try to hold them to the end. So uh, we're going to move on to the clear breasted group because that was a striped breasted group. And now the clear breasted um, groups and the most famous of which are is the white throated sparrow. Um, the beautiful birds, um, they, again, as they're their name would indicate they have a white throat and their chest is pretty clear. Uh, the the white crown sparrow, another a cousin to theirs, this is the bicycle helmet, uh, as I've learned to call it over the years, a uh, member of the group. Uh, American tree sparrow, uh, superficially looks a lot like a chipping sparrow that may nest in your yard um, in large numbers in the, in the winter. Um, the field sparrow, uh, more southern of the species, and chipping sparrow, which uh, in the winter months is certainly a more southern species. We do not see them up here as rare up here for us in the winter months. That, but that's the clear-breasted group. And we're going to start with the white-throated sparrow. Um, the white throats are, are, are known, of course, for their uh, their song, the old Sam Peabody, 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 that mournful. And we'll we'll hear that, and and uh, probably might start hearing that pretty soon. They'll they'll start singing uh, as soon as the weather really starts to turn towards spring. The daylight daylight lengthens, but this group the, the birds with the 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 black and the white striping on the on the head um, and the white throat, and the they come in two varieties, two genetic varieties. They have tan stripe and white stripes and then a lot of people of course uh, in the past mistakenly thought that the tan stripes were the females and the white stripes were the males thinking that was just a, a, a degree of sexual dimorphism but nope they are more like a black lab and a yellow lab they are um, there's two distinct uh, color forms of the same bird i read uh, an article years ago that uh, somebody was studying them extensively and trying to uh you know, tie in the two color groups to um, a habitat or, you know, distribute all kind of, they're trying to explain why the, the two different stripes. And the only thing that the guy could come up with is that white striped males tended to select for tan striped females. And why that is, is <laughs> evidently uh, he came up with that the white striped females tended to sing where the tan striped females didn't sing uh and maybe he was just the the, the white striped males were being wanted to make sure they weren't they were selecting for a female i don't know but they uh that was the only thing he could come up with uh, in the research project so uh they are beautiful birds they do the yellow lures uh, on the eyes uh, are, are much more pronounced obviously in the white stripe because it contrasts so well and of course in the spring 
um, they that gets brighter and, and when they're moving into breeding plumage uh, they they do have uh, the white the clear breast no striping it, it's it's kind of dirty but it's a, it's a, it's a clear breast and one of the things about these birds is uh, you know and when you start moving towards spring when we're in spring bird watching. Uh, these birds like to feed on the oak catkins up in the trees, and so uh, these will be sparrows that are acting like warblers up there. You'll, you, you know, when you're warbler watching and you're looking up there for these birds bouncing around, you, and all of a sudden you see the white-throated sparrows up there feeding up in the tops of the trees. You don't, you don't seem that doesn't seem right. You know, there's sparrows are supposed to be on the ground, but uh, these guys have a, a real habit of liking to feed up in trees, especially in the spring. Um, but they're very widespread. Uh, they're probably the most common backyard native sparrow outside of juncos. Uh, they uh, and they do. Uh, they are hybrids. They hybridize with juncos occasionally, um, but they are they are a beautiful, beautiful sparrow. And then the white crown sparrows, uh, a, a, a larger cousin to the white throated sparrows, and the Zonotrichia genus. And this is like it's called the bicycle helmet sparrow. Um, the it, it has a much wider central white stripe down the crown, up on the crown, and the black stripes. And it does kind of give a, a, a more of an appearance of a, a bicycle helmet uh, on them. Um, they're beautiful birds. It's large um, gray, clear chest of theirs, and their pink bills and their pink legs. It, they're just a striking, striking bird. Now, when I wrote this article originally, keep in mind I'd only been in Missouri for a year. And when I wrote this article, I wrote about how common white crown sparrows were. And I did get some blowback from that from people from most parts of the state. Well, they're not that common here. But you remember, like I said, I'd only been here a year and I had them all the time in my yard uh, and at the Nature Center in, in Blue Springs. And I was seeing white crown sparrows everywhere. And of course, that was uh, just my my observation for only having been here for a year and on northwestern Missouri. So they are a more western bird. They do occur much more commonly out west. If you've ever bird watched in winter in the western states, you do know that uh, white crown sparrows are very common out in the out in the western U.S. So um, they uh, the further east you go, this is a kind of a bit of a prize bird in North Carolina, where I was from. Uh, it, we we always uh we're happy to get those on the christmas bird count and things so um now one of the big differences here that is not male female uh but the adult white crown sparrow uh here on the left and it has that classic bicycle helmet uh black and white but the first year birds the immature uh white crown sparrows um are much more subdued and it's more of a rustyish uh, color stripes where the the adults are black. This is more uh, rusty colored, and the crown the the crown is more grayish, and the the the, the side stripes, the mallard, I mean the eye stripes are more gray as well. This is a good picture showing the difference in the, the difference between the, an adult and a, an immature bird in this picture. So, and we do see both, you know, and especially in the fall when you're you're, you're out there, they're they're coming in in good numbers. But that will jump out at you. I had an immature show up in my backyard. When I lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and um, I had people come into my yard to see that bird. They were people, you know, white crowns are uh, uncommon enough that people who keep year list don't want to pass up an opportunity to get a white crown sparrow on their list uh, out east. So um, they are they're they're one of my favorite sparrows. Big, big, robust, almost the same size as a as a fox sparrow. So they're definitely a big sparrow. Now the American tree sparrow um, in is a northern species uh, that comes down uh, in, in the winter here and can be in huge numbers. Um, it, it has this rusty crown stripe. It has white outer tail feathers. And, and famously, it has a what we call a stick pen, a, a central dark spot on this otherwise clear chest. And that lo yellow lower mandible is a very good field mark and good to note whenever you're, um, you're taking uh, your field notes and looking at it. Uh, and some years it, we have just huge flocks of them, especially out in the pasture land uh, and, and here in northwest Missouri. And they come to my feeders whenever we get a good heavy snow. And that's about the only time I see them. I live in, you know, a fairly urban neighborhood, not super central city, but um, we're uh, we're in a suburban neighborhood that uh, it, there's lots of houses and, and the American tree sparrows do come and feed at the, at the feeders, but really only in the harsh conditions, super cold or, or snow cover uh, brings them in. 
uh, and they're, they're, they're pretty sparrows. But if you go out and, and most winters and you're riding in the country, and again, and the two birds you'll see flying off the side of the road in the winter are going to be juncos and American tree sparrows. So they're, uh, they're flying off there. They're, they're, they're quite common. So uh, they're the black legs, again, you know, if you get a chance and you get to see it, that's something you can note as well. Uh, uh, this is a bird that's kind of in question with the, you know, reason we do Christmas bird counts and the reason we, you know, we do the surveys that we do is keeping up with what's happening with the species. And, and American tree sparrows are a bird that we're a little bit concerned about. I mean, they haven't been uh, coming in numbers um, that, that we used to see and like a lot of things. But, you know, by, by doing these Christmas bird counts all over the country um, and Project Feeder Watch and all this uh, citizen science, we're able to see, you know, study whether these birds are, the numbers are really going down as much as we think they are, or if they're maybe not migrating as far south as they used to, or maybe they're migrating further south than they used to. That's why those, that, uh, participating in those type of uh, citizen science programs are so important, and we always encourage you to, to get involved with those because we need to be able to document things like uh, what are going on with all the native sparrows, um, but the American tree sparrows being one in particular that we're a little bit concerned about. Um, another uh, for winter, a, a, a much, much more Southern species, the, the field sparrow. And this is, this is a bird of the sparrow group that's much softer as the word I like to describe it. They, they're not as boldly marked as a lot of the, the sparrows are. They, it's, it's a softer uh, rusty cap and a soft uh, eye stripe, but that eye ring is very distinct. That, that, that they have white eye rings that, that do stand out, uh, very vocal, the ping pong ball dropping. Da, 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 da. We hear it in spring and they, they nest in the area, but in the winter, they are definitely uh, more Southern. Uh, they I, I think, you know, you guys down Springfield Way and Cape Girardeau, that area, uh, and probably have them all winter, whereas up here, we, we won't uh, see them until spring, so. And the most urban of all native sparrows is the chipping sparrow. Uh, they, they nest commonly in, in urban settings, and again, another bird that winters in southern Missouri that we just don't see up here in the winters. So it's very uncommon. Uh, but the it, the shipping sparrow is well known by a lot of people just because they do nest you know, so frequently in uh, in ur urban areas. They have long, slender tails. They have that uh, uh, that r real r rufous cap. I had a, a, a young man just uh, corrected me one time at the uh, nature center when I was talking about the chipping sparrow. He said, "No, that's a magenta cap, Mister McKellar. That's not a not a rufous cap. Okay, so a magenta cap." Um, it is it is a brightish on the brighter side of the rufous caps that we see on sparrows, but that black stripe through the eye uh, is, is so distinct, and the and the white sparrow the, the white throat, but they they really do have long slender tails, which is another field mark. And they for us we up here in northern Missouri they start showing up sometimes in early March. Uh, they don't winter very far south. And I think, you know, Springfield area, that area, you guys down south probably see them uh, at, at feeders down there in the winter months. But uh, for us up here, uh, you know, it's a spring and nesting bird for us. So, and then the last group uh, is one I, 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 I divided them in two, but now I, I do it more in thirds because uh, there's those that don't fit well in the clear breast or in the striped breast, and I call them the dirty breasted group. Um, the and, and and when people hear me say juncos and talk about juncos in my sparrow program, you know they 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 look at me funny and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, it's a junco, it's not a sparrow. No, a sparrow, a junco is a sparrow, it's a native sparrow, um, and it belongs uh, in, in this program. The Harris sparrow, which of course for us up here in Missouri and in Kansas City area, that's the mascot bird for the Burroughs Audubon uh, group here in town. Uh, and, and there's reasons for that. And then the swamp sparrow, I call them dirty hairy, uh, for or, which I'll talk about here in just a minute. But the dirty breasted groups, so striped breast, clean breast, and dirty breast. All right. The, the junco, the dark eyed junco. Uh, is a sparrow. It just doesn't have the name name sparrow in its name, but it is in that group, and it is uh, 
uh, widespread all over. And there are many subspecies of, of dark-eyed juncos. If you, it depends on how long you've been bird watching. If you know, you remember the older field guys, which had them broken down into several different species. Um, and then they finally lumped them together. Uh, and, and now they're all uh, of the dark, there's the dark eyed group and there's a yellow eyed group, which is much more Southern Mexico and then uh, one in, in uh, Southeast Arizona area. But the dark eyed group has several subspecies uh, within it. And uh, one of the telltales, uh, the, the, the most common of the uh, subspecies that we get here uh, in Missouri is the Oregon group. Uh, and that is that dark hood and that brown back, uh, it, it looks, you can see how it contrasts so sharply to the dark eyed junco, the slate colored group, which is the one uh, on the bottom. And it's all over. And those do, are, 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 the males tend, the older males, especially, the males tend to be the dark slaty color, and females tend to be the, the much more light gray, uh, lighter gray color when you, when you see them. But one of the things that really jumps out at you, of course, is when they fly up off the side of the road or fly from your bird feeders, is you tend to see that white outer tail feather flash as they take off and fly away. And that, uh, that's one way, you know, whenever you're bird watching and riding and birds are flying up off the side of the road, and especially in the winter months, and, you know, it, it, if you don't get a great look at the, at, the, at the bird and you see that white tail, outer tail flash that can help you, you can, oh yeah, those are juncos, you know, it's, it's, it's very telling and, uh, and, and very showy. So the, the pink bill, uh, they, it, it's, a it's another because it contrasts so sharply with that dark face, that slate face. Then uh, the they really do jump out at you. A fun group of birds, snowbirds, another nickname for them. Um, if you travel to different parts of the country, like I say, that white winged junco, uh, the race up in the uh, the uh, South Dakota mountains and out west, they have. You know, the Oregon group, the pink sided group, there are several different uh, groups uh, and uh, subspecies that you can identify when you travel. Um, but here in town, uh, mostly you're going to see slate colored juncos and a few Oregons uh, are, tend to be the two that we get here in our feeders. So now the Harris sparrow, another large sparrow. This again, about the cousins with the white crowned sparrow and with the white throated sparrow. And the Harris sparrow uh, is the mascot bird for uh, our local Audubon chapter here because of its range in particular. The, the Harris sparrow is restricted to the central part of the U.S. And we're talking about, you know, it's nesting territory to its wintering territory and then east and west. And, and the Kansas City region is traditionally about as far east as you can uh, typically uh, depend on seeing the Harris sparrows in winter. Now, I know there's been range expansion over the years, and, you know, I, I, my life, uh, Harris sparrow was in North Carolina way back before he moved, moved out here, but that bird calls quite a stir, and there were hundreds of birders turned out to, to see that Harris sparrow that winter. So, uh, the, but typically Kansas City, you know, it makes for a good mascot bird because people want to see it. If you're a traveling bird watcher and you and you're in Kansas City and you're in winter, you'd like to see a Harris sparrow if you live in California or if you live in Maine or something like that and you're here. Um, it, it is a location you can see them and they're beautiful sparrows. This is their winter plumage. They're the, the brown on the side of the face, the, 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 the black crown, the black bib and varying degrees of black on them in winter. This one, and, and, and they have a very stark white belly, which is uh, a, a very good field mark of theirs. And that pink, again, a pink bill, orangish bill, uh, uh, contrasts nicely against the that black face. And they are large uh, sparrows, like I said, that helps uh, them jump out at you too. Uh, but the other, if you're lucky enough to have them to stick around until you know, the first week of May and, and, and when they, they have transitioned over winter into their breeding plumage before they migrate uh, to the north to, to, to nest, they are a, a much more striking bird with that beautiful uh, uh, silver gray face instead of the brown. Uh, you know, when it, it, the, the brown, as you know, would be much more camouflaged in the winter and uh, it's safer for you. But whenever you want to attract a mate, it's nice to be uh, much more shiny and 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 pretty, and that's the uh, this is a breeding plumage, uh, hair sparrow on the bottom right. So, and it, again, this is one of those birds that uh, when I first moved out here, 
Um, you know, we find them in brush piles out in fields. <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, they, they'll, be, they'll be along edges, but man, field edges, uh, pasture edges, if there's a brush pile located uh, in, in a field, there always seems to be white crown and, and Harris sparrows in them in the winter months. Uh, some winters we have a lot, some winters we don't have a, a, that many again, and that's that, you know, do we get a, ha a harsh stretch of weather in October, and does that push them further south down into Oklahoma and uh, further uh, in, in Arkansas and uh, points south, or if it's milder, do they stay just to the north and, 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 and try to survive the winters up there? Migration is a very dangerous business, and, you know, why do you uh, have want to migrate any further than you have to? Is climate change part of it? They're not migrating as far as they used to, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots to be studied there. Um, but this is, uh, you know, we have to go with what's typical and what's historic. And Harris sparrows uh, are, are, and I know, are probably more common here in the western part of the state. I mean, they've increased out, out east where you guys are. You know, beautiful, beautiful birds. All right, and then the, the and the dirty group I, I, I call uh, the swamp sparrow dirty hairy because he has he has a real of all the sparrows he has the dirtiest looking chest. Now the picture on the left is an immature bird, you know, taken in the fall that's that, nested, but the the one on the right is a nice winter adult bird and a deep dark rusty cap and gray face. And one the, the feature you know one of the things that keys me in on uh, swamp sparrows. When they were, especially when they were seeing them and, and flushing them, is they're very reddish on their back. They have red, red, and a lot of red in their wings, and rufous in their wings, and rufous in their tail. And so when you fly, you see this real reddish flash as they go diving into the brush. So um, the, uh, the that central uh, the the stripe uh, down the center of the, the the crown can be very distinct. I've only seen these at my bird feeders like twice in my life. They, they don't typically come to bird feeders. Uh, they're usually down in the wet areas. Um, you know, Los Bluffs is a great place and I'm sure uh, other wetlands all around the state is a much, much uh, better um, place to see them. But I have, on, don't like on twice in my life, see them actually eating in a bird feeder, which is is just not very common. So they're, uh, they're really, really uh, pretty sparrow. Yeah, so, well, that are the groups, the three, remember the three major groups, the striped, the striped breast, the clear breast, and the dirty breasted group. Uh, and, you know, the taking of the field notes. And I'm sure you guys will agree that, you know, that uh, they're far more than just little brown birds. And if you want to, uh, I, I have lots of videos up on my YouTube channel. This is uh, it's called Mark's Backyard Bird. And it's um, it's on YouTube. Uh, you can search by Mark's Backyard Birds, or you can skew, uh, scan the QR code, and it, they, uh, they're uh, you know a lot if you know bluebird videos, hummingbird videos, lots of things like that. I've been doing this for a long, long time, and there's lots of uh, history up there. But um, I really appreciate Dana for the invite tonight, and we wanted to leave some time to, for questions. And I, I know there are questions over here. On the left, um, uh, Danny, do you want to do, pick out some, or you uh, how you want to do that? Mark, sure. Um, the very first question that you had is actually one that I think you answered within your presentation. Someone asked about savanna sparrows in Joplin. Right, right, right. Yeah, that would again. There's that's a savanna sparrows a, a prime example of a bird that uh, winters way down there, uh, especially in. Um, that in the open areas, and I'd be curious if, if anybody on here has ever had savanna sparrows at their bird feeders, because I'm not aware of that. I've, I've never had it personally, and I'm wondering if you guys that live south and 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 in the winter, if you ever see uh, savanna sparrows visiting your bird feeders, that'd be a, a question I'd love to know. So. Mark, I actually myself have a follow up question. Um, we have a very small prairie uh, restoration, uh, just a few acres. And we right now have wintering Savannah sparrows. Now nice. I can't comment yeah. like, how long that's been happening. Right. Um, but do you have any comments at all about, you know, why that would be, or if there's maybe range expansion going on or I, anything else? I highly suspect that's it. I highly suspect that, uh, like so much, so many birds, um, again, the, the migration is dangerous game. 
So why go any further south or migrate any further than you have to? And if you can, it, it, I think a lot of these birds that typically, and that's why I said that did this 30 years ago um, originally, and a lot, you hate being one of those people that says, well, it's not nearly as cold as it used to be here, but we all know that that's true. I mean, and it, yeah, the conditions are, are, are quite a bit different. So I think that with, you know, uh, the climate change and milder winters, you are going to see much more of savannah sparrows being not going as far south and, and, and several of these species that way too. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh and it, I, I saw one study that is calling that within the next 50 years, we're not going to have goldfinches nesting in Missouri anymore. You know, they're because of uh, climate change if things keep going the way they are that a lot of uh, the nesting ranges of a lot of our birds are going to shift north and goldfinches are one of the species that may not be nesting here you know, if, if climate change keeps going the way we it, it's going so we need to make changes i see one question here i have to answer um it says roger would like to request a program on winter cuckoos in missouri um it, this, there's an inside joke there uh roger still stood up still doesn't have a black bill cuckoo on his life list and he, it, it's been a thing with us for years and years and years. And every time I'm birding, especially at Dunn Ranch, and I find one, I text him and say, yeah, he's right out here outside my window. Poor Roger, he's still chasing that black bill cuckoo. That's what that comment's about. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Val said, who was the person that asked about Savannah Sparrows down by Joplin, says she's seen them near their feeders but drinking water like not actually which makes there sense you go. Yep. the most important thing you can provide for birds absolutely especially in winter yeah mark there were a number of different people that said um in the chat that um they don't they are not seeing as many white-throated sparrows mm. um as in previous years so someone in the independence area said that first and then a number of other people agreed do you have any comments on that well, that is that falls into that American tree sparrow. Com you know, when I was talking about the, uh, those guys, we're seeing a lot less of those, and and that's why you know please you know again participate in in Project Feeder Watch and and, and it, you know, that citizen science programs because we need more information on all these birds. White throated sparrows are something that a lot of people will take for granted because they you know they have been so common and. Uh, and they are sparrows that don't, you, it, it, but we need to be able to track that activity. And, it, you know, are the people in uh, Omaha seeing more white throated sparrows than they used to see? Um, are the people in uh, Oklahoma City seeing more? Uh, are, is it a shift? Is it, or, or, or are the numbers down there, down here, down there? You know, it, that's what we need to know. That's what, and that's where you and I as bird watchers can really help the scientific community is by, by participating in those. But yes, you, I agree with you. I, I, the, with the person who made that comment, I, I'm seeing less white throated sparrows. I'm seeing less white crown sparrows when we, I mean, the last couple of Christmas bird counts up here, um, the numbers for a lot of the native sparrows were way down and that's disturbing. You know, that is truly, uh, truly a disturbing trend. So. Let's see. Here, here. Yeah. Mark, uh, Edge Wade comments that field sparrows are now more common here in winter than in the past, and the most recent edition of MDC is enjoying Missouri's birds shows some changes in the sparrow occurrence. So yeah. because, you know, partially because of exactly what you just said, all of the really, really important citizen science documentation, not yeah, just absolutely. us being like, huh, I think I see less or I think I see more. Um, we need yeah, that. There's, there's a whole lot to that and, and, and birds uh, as a whole. I mean, uh, is are, are there more hummingbirds wintering uh, in, in Missouri, or is it that there's just more eyes, there's more experienced eyes, there are more people leaving their hummingbird feeders up than we used to? That's something that really you know we had to struggle with because we just didn't have that information before, and we can't say all of a sudden because they could have been here. We just weren't you know know they were here. It's a good observation. Great follow-up question from Betsy. Uh, does one need to do something special to participate in Project Feeder Watch or just keep entering observations into eBird? Well, eBird, another avenue that's so important. That's, you know, every, every avenue, if you are willing to take the time and you are willing to make, you know, again, it's best uh, and most accurate 
uh, observation that you can entering it in all any of any and all of these platforms is important. I mean, all that data is is getting compiled, and so yeah, if you will, we can enter. It. And I know some people who don't like entering eBird sightings uh, for their backyard. They just personally don't feel right about that, but they don't mind doing Project Feeder Watch. And, and so it, it depends on how you feel about it. You know, I, I think some people are afraid that if they entered on eBird, it's going to have a bunch of people come over to their yard that they don't want, you know, trouncing around their neighborhood and stuff like that. And I understand that and other privacy, but if you're willing to do those, all of that information is important. Mark, I don't want to forget this question that was in the Q&A from a few minutes ago from Joel. Is there is there a reddish, quote unquote, here it's quote unquote, reddish Lincoln Sparrow? Uh, I, a lot of the sparrows have just a highly variation in their, their colors and in subspecies. And um, I yeah, I, I don't know in, in, in what part of their range, but I guarantee you somewhere they're more reddish than, than gray and back and forth. The more famous two for that for being in reddish in color, like I said, were the, the, the fox sparrow and the song sparrow, uh, and then the swamp sparrow being the clear breasted group. But um, the, the Lincoln the, the fa sparrows are so famous for the variations in their color. And when I do a program on bird identification, I always talk about how color is a very undependable field mark. Whenever you're identifying birds, you have to uh, you know, use size. You have to use uh, the the field marks don't change, and the color, the the bills, the tail shape, the you know, length, and how it's, you know color should be okay. Yeah, well, this one's reddish, but yeah, there's individual variation within that species. But it had the bicolored bill, or it had the black legs, and so all those other field marks uh, will will help you get to that conclusion because it's so easy to to go, oh, it's reddish, it's got to be this. Well, that's you know, there's variation in all in, in all the in all birds, really. So yeah, but somewhere I bet you there are reddish groups, but mostly for me, Lincoln sparrows scream gray. That that like I said, they they that that's the primary color for them in the face and in the back and things like that. That's you know, that, that's just what I'm used to. Yeah. Mark, someone asked when you were speaking of the American tree sparrow, you mentioned um, a stick pin. Can you explain that again, real quick? Yeah, I wish I had a better picture. I can't believe of all. I went through all my American tree sparrow pictures, and every one of us turned just slightly to the left or slightly to the right, and everything. And there was none that were just straight dead on. Um, but in the center of a, a, and most, and not all, again, you know, sometimes it can be very, very faint. But most American tree sparrows, like when I moved out here, they were new to me. Uh, and so my impression when I started, when I first got here was, oh, it looks like a, a chipping sparrow with a black dot in the center of his chest. And that's, you know, that's kind of what it reminds me. They're not as bold and striking as a, as a chipping sparrow, but they do have that rufous cab and that clear breast. But that stick pen, a lot of times it's in the shape of a little, I don't know if you can see the camera, is in a little V, a dark V in the center of the chest. Uh, and, and, but again, it can be very pronounced or it can be very light. Uh, it just depends on the bird and then, of course, how it's angling and the wind's blowing the feathers and there's lots of things that affect it. But that's what that stick pen uh, is uh, that we talk about on the American tree sparrows. But remember, that bicolored bill is a better field mark. That yellow lower mandible is a really good field mark on American tree sparrows. Here's another question that has to do with chipping sparrows, but those are the two that are most confused right. with each other, right? I think yep. largely because of that roof is cap. Yep. Um, <laughs> but Val says, I count chipping sparrows as a sign of spring in southwest Missouri. Is this right? I Yes, so, very much so. They, they, I, I do the same thing here. Uh, you know, for me, the first signs of spring up here in, in, in our area, one is red-winged blackbirds. Um, uh, common grackle and chipping sparrows. Those are three, you know, robins are here all winter, you know, bluebirds are here all winter. They're, you know, they, the old things about robins being the signs of spring, but those are three species that I, I when I hear those chipping sparrows singing out and, and, you know, when I walk out in the morning, boy, that that's spring, you know, that is a, a true sound of spring. So down there, I'm, I'm sure they're singing earlier and they're, they're coming into your feeders and uh, that, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. It's a, a real good um, sign of spring. Uh, Edge comments that white-throated are being seen in good numbers in central Missouri. 
One reason for a market decrease in a particular area may be due to habitat loss. Development means bare ground or short grass where brush piles may have been previously. So habitat anecdotally, loss is yeah. anecdotally speaking, I would say that I still have good numbers of white-throated sparrows around my area. But again, that's anecdotal. That is not you know project feeder watch over years or eBird over years, as you mentioned before, Mark. Guys, I deal with so many people obviously every day in the store, you know, which is backyard feeder people far more than real super dedicated bird watching people. Um, but they can a lot of them comment about what they're seeing less of than they did 10 years ago and things like that. We talk about that and white throated sparrows do get mentioned. You know, I used to see a lot of those and, and they're more woodland at what I, you know, I've always associated as far as in, in the urban setting, I, I used to live out in a wide open part of Kansas City and my two prominent uh, sparrows there all winter were white crowned and Harris's well now I live in a more wooded part of Kansas City and definitely white throated are far more common and I hardly ever see white crowns and Harris's and things like that so habitat has a lot to do with it and it's just right I mean loss of habitat is just you know we beat that drum a lot but it's true I and mean, you know they there's you know when we we, we know that you know ethanol the the uh, con the CRP program, the Conservation Reserve program, was so important to sp native sparrows. And once the price of ethanol went up, the corn got up, a lot of farmers broke their CRP contracts, plowed under the CRP land, and so there was again that wiped out a lot of uh, native sparrow habitat right there. And and, and now some of it's coming back because the the prices you know. Uh, fluctuated a bit so yeah habitat lost is you know, for for ground birds that depend on the ground um especially here in in the prairie region they're greatly affected by that that disking up of prairies and and, and personally i'm not uh fescue is you know enemy number one in my word when it comes to grassland birds um so you know the native grass patches are so important and the weedy edges are so important and when those things get disc up we lose a lot of sparrow habitat Mark, thank you. You just made my policy heart very happy with that, <laughs> with that conversation. And also just really quickly plug everyone. Um, next week, we have Carol David from the Missouri Prairie Foundation talking about prairie and why it matters. Um, yep. Mark, we have a question um, from Donna that she said she may have missed the conversation. So this is towards the beginning when you were talking about our introduced sparrows, the mm -hmm. English house sparrow, European tree sparrow. She says, who are the they that introduced these sparrows in the first place? Ooh, this is kind of a hard one because truly it was the scientific community that introduced the, 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 the house sparrow originally. It, it really, it, you know, we know the story of the, the, the starling and that was an acting company in New York and they thought that America should be blessed with uh, all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare's plays. And, and so we can point the finger and say, bad, bad. You know, you people didn't know what you were doing. But when it comes to the house sparrows, that was a whole different thing. You know, they were supposed to be introduced. They, they were supposed to be the savior of the American farmer. Um, and it, and it's, I mean, it's like of all the starling species you could have introduced into this country, same thing with the sparrows, uh, the house sparrows, of all the sparrow species that you could have introduced into this country. Um, but one of the reasons they did that is because they were so common and they are commensal with man. I mean, historically, uh, they're in Pompeii. They, uh, the remains of Pompeii, they have fossilized remains of relatives of the house sparrow group there. I mean, so they've always been around humans. And so, uh, and again, it was before really good sound science. Um, and so it was a mistake. And hey, we introduced kudzu into the South to be for erosion control. And there's lots and lots of examples of, of uh, mistakes that were made, you know, before we, we, you know, learned. And the house sparrow was one of them. The, now, the Eurasian tree sparrow, you, saw, you St. Louis people know that story far better than I do. But I wrote an article about them years ago called The Tale of Two Cousins. And, you know, how amazing they're, they're closely related but why one of those two exploded and became so successful 
And the other one just stayed concentrated there in the St. Louis area and has just very slowly expanded its range. Just the aggressive nature versus a not so aggressive nature of uh, two birds are that closely is a, is a fascinating story. Mark, do we have time for one more question, sure. do you think? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, and so I think this is a topic that quite a lot of people have been wondering about this year. I would guess you've probably encountered this at your store. Um, so Linda says, um, she speaks in the chat about she had sparrows flying into her coop eating her crumbled chicken feed. Um, and she switched to pellets and it has been a concern because of the avian influenza. Um, <laughs> That's a, yeah, I, you know what, I, for the avian influence, obviously it's just a current concern for everybody and bird, people who feed birds, you know, we've been following this since the very beginning and I, I put a lot of my faith in uh, the information page set up for, by Cornell, lab ornithology, and we know, and you're right, I mean, chickens are uh, the most vulnerable and the waterfowl was the most want, uh, vulnerable. Uh, and, and of course, the predators who eat those. But as far as the, the songbirds go, we're still not seeing, unless this has jumped, and I, I, and I haven't uh, gotten word on this, they, we're still not seeing any uh, really in, songbird, in the songbird world. We're not seeing it pass there. It's not, and if you study wildlife, you know there's two words you never use, and that's never and always, because there's going to be an exception to every rule like that. So you never say never, never say always. But uh, it... it I, I don't think there's a problem there. I, you know, I think I would put much more faith in the veterinary part of the, the understanding of that. Um, and, and of course, the Cornell Lab, uh, their website keeps things uh, really updated. But I monitored what you know the, the state organizations were issuing about that, and the and and you know, on the national level uh, is where I, I get that information from. There, Dana. I, like I said, I am not an expert on avian disease, that's for sure. So. No, I understand. Um, I have had the same results from researching the same types of sources that you have as well. Um, right. So let's see, I think we're out of questions. I know, Mark, did you want to just say something briefly about like how you're going to put this on your YouTube and you can also answer questions in that yeah, venue, absolutely. right? If you, if you want to contact me, um, I, I, like I said, we, the YouTube channel is a great way to do it. I have lots of videos on there. And if you, I get all the questions that pop up on there, so, you know, whether it's the, the Sparrows program, this is going to go live. We're going to put this up on our YouTube channel once we get it all transferred and loaded and all that kind of good stuff. But there's lots of other topics up there. And I'm always willing to, to answer questions. Like I said, my tagline since I started this business was combined, let's talk birds. Well, the internet has spread that and opened it up. So feel free to contact me, um, backyardbirdcenter.com, um, the uh, mark at Backyard Bird Center. They, you know, there's ways to contact me. All that information is on the YouTube channel. And, you know, we're always uh, happy to talk about birds. You know, Ruth, who works for him, many of you know, I've uh, got a great staff, Carrie, um, and we're always willing to answer questions for you. And I'll try to get back to you as quick as I can if you want to send me a question. <laughs>